You are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna, but today's case is the New Year's Eve disappearances of Mary Flanagan and Samuel Todd. Now, these both happened at a New Year's Eve party where they would both disappear. And this was under the strangest circumstances in both cases. However, it couldn't have been connected because they were 25 years apart. So was this as simple as a runaway in these cases or was it as complicated as a murder? By the way, I have posted my Wicked Winter content all month and there will be a playlist linked down below if you need to catch up if that is something that you need to do today. If you are bored or just don't know what you're gonna do with your time and you're not gonna go to a party, then maybe go ahead and watch those. But I do post this content with the most respect in my heart and I really do just want to tell the victim stories to share it with the world. I by no means mean any harm to the victims, their family, or anyone involved. I truly just want to spread their light and their story to anyone who will listen. So yeah, let's get back to the story. So it was 1959 in London and Mary Flanagan was a 16 year old living with her family in West Ham. Now she had been born on June 9th of 1943 to the Flanagan family and her parents were Mary and Barry, but she has two sisters named Eileen and Brenda, as well as a brother named Kevin. Mary attended the Holbrook Road Secondary School, but she also worked a lot of the time, anytime she had free time, at the Tate and Lyle Sugar Refinery. And not only did she do that, but she also worked at an optician's office in her spare time. And that wasn't all. When Mary had an ounce of time where she wasn't at school or working, she would actually volunteer with the Blind Association to just give back and help others. I mean, I mean, she was known as a bright and friendly girl who was just a breath of fresh air and wanted to help everyone that she possibly could. So it was a normal day on New Year's Eve 1959 and Mary woke up in her fourth floor bedroom that she shared with her sisters at E15 Wallace Road. She had slept in that morning even though she was supposed to go to work at the Tate and Lyle factory but she decided that she actually wasn't going to go into work that day. But when she woke up that morning, she did decide maybe she should go because there was a New Year's Eve party at her work that would have happened after her shift and she wanted to go to that. And of course she couldn't go if she didn't go to work, if she called in sick. So she decided she would be a little bit late, but she would go into work. And so at about 1 p.m. that afternoon, she would actually get up, get ready, kiss her family goodbye, and begin the journey to work. And her father said that she didn't often kiss the family goodbye, but it wasn't so out of the blue that they were worried about it or they sensed that something was off. Now this was a three mile journey to her work and the family watched Mary walk away in her checkered skirt, red knitted coat, high heels, and she was also carrying a wicker basket. The whole family knew that she had planned to be out late to go to this party and at this time 16 year olds were practically adults. They had to work like one and they were just kind of treated like one as well. However, her family did still deeply care for her and of course wondered, you know, where she was if she didn't come home in time or what she was doing. And so the next morning when it was New Year's Day and she still was not home in her bed, they began to really panic and her parents immediately headed down to this factory to make sure that she had just, you know, overslept there or, you know, gotten a little too drunk, anything of the sorts. And so they headed down to the factory to talk to some of the employees and they would be in for the shock of their lives because these employees just looked at them very confused when they had asked them where Mary was and they said, Mary hasn't been to work in two weeks and they just thought that she was incredibly sick this whole time but her parents had recalled her both leaving for work and coming home at the times where she would have gone to the shift for the past two weeks. Her parents contacted the police immediately upon hearing all of this and they were actually the first questioned in her disappearance. Doesn't really make a lot of sense, especially in this case, but a search was conducted. They were scouring the area, police and volunteers, screaming Mary's name and they couldn't find anything. They were putting missing persons posters up saying that she was 5'2", medium build girl with dark wavy hair, hazel eyes, and a tanned complexion. Now, local newspapers did their best to put out the word that she was missing, but 
Them and the police alike both believe she was just a runaway, so they didn't really put any credence into how much they needed to search for her or how much this was huge news because they just thought she would be back at any time. Because you see, as we all know extremely well if you are into true crime, missing teenage girls especially are often looked at as they couldn't just have had some sort of horrible incident happen to them. They obviously just ran away, probably with a boy, and they'll be back soon. And this is something that is often said, and so these teenage girls aren't looked into until it is too late. And a lot of times this can cause the family of the victims to be extremely angry at police because they're not doing anything and they keep telling police, no, they would not be with a boy. However, in this case, it's a little bit different because Mary's family actually believed that that could really be the case. They believed that this was an extremely good theory and that a year prior to Mary's disappearance, her father had actually introduced her to a man who was in his 20s named Tom. And he was an Irishman who worked with the Merchant Navy as a stoker, so he shoveled the coal into the steam engine fires. And Tom and Mary had been dating for almost a year at this point. However, right before she disappeared, they were said to have broken up. Now, not only were they said to be in a relationship, but they were at this point of her disappearance said to be engaged to be married. However, on December 30th, a day prior to when Mary just vanished, she had told her family that basically they had ended things because Tom had been caught in a lie. You see, Tom had been telling Mary that he lived with his landlady, so he lived on his own but had this roommate that was his landlady. However, it would then come out that his landlady was actually his mother and he was still living at home. Due to this lie, Mary broke up with Tom and when her father, who introduced the two of them together, heard about this, he had a conversation with the two of them and was basically very angry and the Mary siblings would say that he was kind of yelling at them, especially Mary, and saying that, you know, basically she shouldn't have broken up with him, they needed to be together. And Mary went to bed that night in tears. Now, her family actually thought, after a few months of Mary being missing, that Tom could have had something to do with it because when she first went missing, Tom was very much involved in the investigation and searching for her. He, you know, scoured everywhere, calling out her name, but a few months in, he just dropped everything. He wanted nothing to do with this case. Even though, you know, the police knew that they were a little suspicious of this Tom, they didn't know how to locate him because they had said they knew his first name was Tom, but they didn't know his last. They said they believed it was McGinty at first, but it could have also been McEnty or McGinnis. And they were really confused as to which one it was. And so the police thought, okay, well, we'll search the Merchant Navy records where he was allegedly working to see if there was a Tom McGinty or any of those. And they didn't find any of those names on the records. Mary's family believed that she had possibly run off with Tom to elope somewhere or that possibly she was pregnant with his child and disappeared because of that. Now, Tom was in the area at the time after her disappearance, but I'm not sure that he was afterwards. Did this kind of, was this a cover up on Tom's part where he helped search for her and then he went back to her somewhere where they had eloped and that is why they didn't know who this Tom was anymore because they couldn't find him in the area. It was really unknown whatever happened to Tom and what involvement he had because he was never questioned. But the last known sighting of Mary was at the West Ham tube station where she went often but after this she just vanished. The only other theory that they had to go on was actually a neighbor that Mary had disliked that possibly had something to do with it, but they had nothing other than, you know, a statement that Mary disliked this person to go on, so they had to drop it. For five years, Mary's case was kind of kept on the bulletin at the police department, and they kept her file open, and 
they were really looking into it. However, when she turned 21, they knew that they couldn't do any more because she had reached the age of consent, meaning that they couldn't force her to go home even if they found her, so they thought that it was pointless to continue searching. This is pretty much where Mary Flanagan's investigation would end, but investigators did continue to look out for her social security number to see if they would get any hits anywhere if she was applying for a job or anything that could connect her to still being alive. They didn't find anything, but this actually wouldn't be the end of her case because it would be reopened in 2013. In 2013, Mary would be 70 years old, but looking further into it, the investigators decided that her case was a complete one-off and they kind of used her case as to show how far they had come in their investigative skills because it was so bad back then and the changes that the policing methods had undergone throughout the years, but that didn't necessarily help Mary. I mean, it showed that throughout these years, they went from knocking on every single neighborhood door and talking to them that way to going on a Facebook page and finding everyone in the neighborhood and talking to them through there. And although I'm not sure how great an investigation would be with Facebook Messenger, it did show just the level of improvement, I guess you could say. Just the technological advances, really, but once again, this did nothing for Mary, and they also appealed for information regarding Tom McGinty, or whatever his last name happened to be, or anyone close to that name at all or who knew anything about him, but it seemed like nobody knew who this man was and had never heard of him and the investigators were saying the key to this is finding Tom if he's still alive. Now the investigators then went to the Flanagan family all those years later to see if they knew any more to just get more information on this case and Mary's siblings were all grown up by this point and her youngest sister Brenda would say that it basically dominated their lives. Once Mary disappeared, that's all that they could talk about and think about and it just consumed them. Investigators began to publicize the case more in Ireland because Tom was said to be an Irishman and they were hoping that maybe someone there would know something, but once again, the search for answers did not come up with anything. And this was also said to be because a few years prior to this, police station where her files were held had been flooded and many of the documents were ruined. Although that did not stop the investigation completely and it's said that a hundred unidentified bodies have been tested to see if it could be Mary Flanagan and so far they haven't found anything but they're still keeping that hope. And in January of 2017, an age progression photo of Mary was actually released and in hopes that somebody would know this woman and that she had just run away. And then that summer, Mary's sister Brenda actually got a call from the Edinburgh Police Department saying that a woman had walked in that looked a lot like this age progressed photo of Mary. And this woman absolutely denied being Mary saying, I'm independent, I can look after myself. But what an odd thing to say when somebody's asking you if you were a missing person. The Flanagan family actually never got to meet this woman because she had just disappeared after coming into the police department and I'm not 100% sure why she even walked in. I don't think it was, you know, to talk about a missing person or anything like that. It was just kind of a fluke that she had walked in and looked like this woman. But Brenda said, she might not want to be in touch with us because she fears rejection, but we need her to know that she won't be rejected. We still hope to find her. If you don't have hope, you don't have anything. Mary is said to be Britain's longest missing persons case and it is still unsolved today and many believe she is actually still alive. Now, unfortunately, many people go missing on New Year's Eve everywhere and another case that I want to go into is the case of Samuel Todd. Now, although these two are not connected by any means due to the fact that they're 25 years apart in different places, there are a very common tie between the two of them and that is the extremely strange circumstances 
in which they disappeared. So now let's fast forward 25 years after Mary's disappearance to 1984, when Samuel Arthur Todd was living in Manhattan, New York as a 24-year-old. Samuel often went by Sam and went to Yale Divinity School, and he was definitely more of an introvert that some would even say was still trying to find his place in the world, and other people who didn't know him would say he was painfully shy or even socially awkward if they didn't take the time to actually get to know him. Now, he loved to express himself through drumming, and he actually became an accomplished jazz drummer. He was also a cross-country runner, and and he had just passed the first exams for Presbyterian ordination. Now, slowly but surely, Sam was finding how he was going to make a difference in this world and what really mattered most to him, but no one really seemed to understand that just yet. Or understand him at all. That New Year's Eve, Sam would go out with some of his friends and his brother Adam on a night out on the town like regular college students and they actually went to two parties but then ended up at a third at 271 Mulberry Street and it was said Sam was kind of having the time of his life. He was drinking beer and vodka and his friend would actually say that Sam was twirling like a young colt, laughing and eating up the energy of the night until he was dizzy. He had to leave me on the dance floor to spin alone while he went out for a breath of air. Now as Sam walked outside, it was about 3 a.m. and his brother Adam had kind of seen him heading towards the door and down the steps. So Adam went with him. However, he started to kind of trip down the stairs so he kind of fell behind and Sam continued to kind of jog ahead. And Sam looked back at Adam and he said he was okay. He was just going to go try to jog and sober himself up in the cold air. And at this point, Sam didn't have identification. He didn't have a wallet and he didn't even have a coat, so this cold really was, or should have, quickly sobered him up. Adam, who was intoxicated himself, went back into the party thinking that his brother would be fine. However, after a little bit, he just had this gut instinct that he needed to go back out and look for Sam. So that's what he did, and he couldn't find him anywhere. I mean, Sam had just run up the street, which was Houston Street, and they couldn't find him anywhere. He should have just run right back and back into the party, but he wasn't there. Now, Adam and some of his friends searched for Sam for a while. They even went to go get Sam's other brother and search for him with the car. They still could not find him. So finally, at 11 a.m. that day, because it was already 3 a.m., so just a few hours later at 11 a.m., they reported him as missing. And he was actually the first report that day from New Year's Eve disappearances and that year there would actually be 16,000 in total and I told you that New Year's Eve disappearances are very common but imagine in a place like New York where there are so many people. Now like I said Adam had gone to get their other brother John who lived in New Jersey at about 4 30 a.m and they had come back to search in the vehicle together. I mean they called hospitals, friends, family. They were driving around looking for Sam and they could not find him anywhere. While the news spread amongst the college students, there was actually 200 volunteers who went to search for him as well, and an article about his disappearance would be published on the front page of the Herald on January 10th. Now you may be thinking, if there were 16,000 people that went missing that day, why did Sam get front page news coverage? Was it because he went to this school? Was it because he was possibly rich? No. Actually, he was just so lucky as to have a friend who worked for the Herald and was the writer. And that's how he got front page news. And this, of course, caused a media frenzy with a whole bunch of different newspapers picking up his story, which meant that a lot more people were willing to search. So it wasn't necessarily a bad thing. I mean, the searches actually deepened into homeless shelters and any sort of bodies of water were dragged to see if he had possibly committed suicide. But this search even spread to different states. It was called the Sam Search, and it was literally in every single state in the country. It was established a kind of meeting zone and then they would all go out and search for him thinking that maybe he had gone somewhere else to another state 
being intoxicated. At first, investigators simply thought that he had been hurt that night while jogging, that possibly he had been struck over the head, maybe by a mugging, and that he had a bit of amnesia, but he would come to and be able to find his family and be fine. This theory slowly faded as Sam continued to be missing. He did not come forward. There was no sightings of him and his family even said that he had been very streetwise because he had been mugged once before. So we kind of knew what to look out for. I mean, if that happens to you once, I'm sure that you're a lot more aware and hypervigilant about that sort of thing. But we do have to remember that he was very intoxicated at this time, which can change, you know, how you do things and how alert you are and how aware you are of your surroundings. Now, posters were not only put in New York, but everywhere across the country during this Sam search that said he was a 24 year old Caucasian male with light brown hair and blue eyes. He stood at 5'11", weighing 135 pounds and wore glasses with dark frames. Now, he has a slim build with two small scars on his left cheek near his eye as well. At the time of his disappearance, he was wearing a dark blue sweatshirt with a circular emblem that had his previous school name on the front with blue jeans, blue sneakers, and a plastic Timex watch. An employee at a men's shelter in Bowery, New York City called investigators saying that after he had seen these missing persons posters, he had remembered that about the time of Sam's disappearance, there was actually a man that had come in looking just like him, that ate a meal at the shelter, and then was seen washing car windows on Greenwich Village. A few other sightings of Sam was seen around New York City, but investigators didn't really look into these much at all because every single picture picture put out of Sam looked different and they it was said that he was a man with a thousand faces because literally every single photo looked like it could be a different person and so these people seeing him were only you know saying that he looked like one photo and not the rest. There were of course theories just like in Mary's case that Sam had just run away from his life that night and his ex-girlfriend who was Jill Tallini said that that just wasn't true, that he loved his family, he loved his life, and he wouldn't have run away. But like I always like to remind you guys, you can only know so much about a person and it's what they allow you to see, especially when it comes to mental health. And it was found that Sam actually was not doing well in school. He had gotten two incompletes the last fall semester, meaning he wouldn't graduate at the time that he was hoping and that he was supposed to. He also was working at a local shelter for $4 an hour, which was great as far as, you know, he was really helping the community, but it was not enough to pay his tuition and his housing and his living expenses, and he was really struggling. Now, Sam's family actually did come from quite a bit of money, and especially his aunt, who would often lend him money for tuition, and it was going entirely towards his tuition because it was so much at the time. It was about $2,000 that she was giving him and he was putting it straight into tuition. And his landlord even said that he had had to talk to Sam previous to his disappearance because he was late on rent and it was beginning to be something that happened often and they couldn't continue to pay for him or wait for him to pay them. His aunt would say she was always willing to pay money to him for whatever he needed, not just his tuition, but his living expenses. She had done it his first year at Yale, and then he just stopped telling her what he needed and didn't ask for any money, and so she didn't know what he needed and thought he was okay, but she said the whole time she would have been willing to give him all the money in the world. Now, his ex-girlfriend who had come forward saying that, oh, he was so happy this time, wouldn't have necessarily known because he had broken up with her that autumn and this was because Jill hadn't wanted to be a minister's wife and that's what Sam was going to school for. So they obviously just weren't meant to be on the same life path and Sam acknowledged this and was okay with this, but Jill was not and she continued to follow him around wanted to continue to be his girlfriend and just really didn't seem to get it. She was actually at the party at Mulberry Street that night. Some people say that all of this combined could have led Sam to want to take his own life that night, but he hadn't been found anywhere. His family actually wrote a letter to the Yale students and just everybody in general, which I thought was just the most touching 
brave thing that a family of someone who disappeared could ever say. As we keenly miss Sam and are baffled by the mystery of his disappearance, we are filled with a sense of unpredictability of life and the absurdity of the way things can happen. We think about the tragic disappearances and separations occurring all over the world, the many disappeared people, some of them known to us in Latin America and other places. We think of the thousands of people whose lives are suddenly cut off by wars, natural disasters, accidents, illness, and crime. From our place of relative comfort and security, we have a sharper sense of the suffering of those whose family members and friends are missing in much more dire circumstances. And I just thought that literally to think of other people in a time where you can take some sort of sympathy from other people, to, to turn that around and want to acknowledge what other people are going through as well is like the biggest form of bravery in my opinion and just shows how wonderful these people are however i do want to say that maybe it was just the fact that they wanted to look good i know a lot of people in a higher class people with more money can want to come across as wonderful people could this have been the case as well Yes, unfortunately, it could have been. Now, it was said that growing up, Sam actually moved a ton as a child and throughout his life and often believed, because of that, that he was almost homeless. He almost felt this pull to the homeless people because he never had a secure home environment since they were constantly moving and that he possibly felt like he had no roots anywhere, which led him to volunteer and work at the shelter and maybe meant that he went to live with him somewhere else as well. Now, it was said in his dorm rooms at Yale, he never unpacked. He said that it wasn't necessary. I mean, he could have maybe disappeared and gone to live with people that he connected the most to and maybe he didn't feel that Yale students were people that he could get along with very well and so he decided to blend in with the homeless population which unfortunately do not get any acknowledgement so he could have easily hid within them. Now Sam seemed to me that he was someone who really believed in helping others but making such a big difference, one that money can't buy, one that people of power don't necessarily exude something that comes deep from your heart, deep from empathy, and something that a lot of people don't understand, which is why he was more of an outcast. I mean, he was someone who always believed in the possibility of revolution. There was actually an art project in the community where everyone had to go trace their hand on a wall. And instead of doing what everybody else was doing, Sam actually put his fist up, kind of like a, a revolutionary stance, and he traced that, and that, that was the only one on the wall, and it's just so incredible to know that someone like Sam wanted to make such a big difference. And the fact that he didn't use his wealth to do so, that he wanted it to come from his mind, his intellect, his empathy, or at least, you know, from what I can tell. Now, something strange that I found was that right before he disappeared, a friend of his had actually told a professor who worked at the school that Sam was a really troubled man and that he needed to be talked to. So this professor did talk to Sam and said that Sam looked ill, but wasn't necessarily suicidal in any way, so he couldn't really do anything for him. He, however, didn't appear to be in full control, is what this professor said. His professor said he seemed to be struggling with believing or following the type of religion that he'd grown up with from his family and that he was currently studying at university. This, in a way, could point to a reason to want a different life if he felt he couldn't change his religion because of his family, so he was just kind of lost. I mean, Sam was also said to be struggling with the idea of not loving someone as they loved him and not understanding why Jill loved him so wholeheartedly and even before the whole minister's wife not wanting to be one thing, he didn't love her as she loved him and that's something that he really struggled with not knowing why that was and some speculated that he was actually gay and 
maybe this didn't line up with his religion and so he couldn't tell anyone which is also why he was struggling with wanting to believe that religion as well. Now whatever the truth is, Sam's case is still unsolved today. He is still missing just like Mary and if you have any information in his case, call the New York Police Department at 646-610-6914. And if you have any information in Mary's case, call Newham Police Missing Persons Unit in the UK on 0044-208-217-5728. In both of these cases, I do seem to wonder if they did run away. And as much as I hate to theorize that at any point because that's what investigators always go to first off, I do think that it is the beginning of the year and for somebody who's struggling in their own life, I could see why they would want to just up and move on and start a new one somewhere else where nobody knows their name. In Mary's case, so many people want to point to Tom as having something to do with it or possibly even being with her somewhere. But I, on the other hand, kind of think that Tom could have been the person she was running from. Her father had basically set up this marriage, this relationship that Mary obviously didn't want to be in. Maybe she was escaping her family and Tom. I mean, maybe her father wanted her to be with him more than she wanted to be with Tom. And she feared being in a life with a man she didn't love, so she escaped. I mean, maybe in those two weeks where she hadn't been at work, she had been, you know, getting all the plans ready to flee and really finding a way to do it in a way nobody would ever find her. Or maybe in those two weeks, she had found somebody that she really did love and she ran away with him knowing that her father would never accept that man over Tom. Or maybe Tom really didn't ever exist. And maybe her family just didn't want to be blamed so they made up this character. I mean, in Sam's case, I think that he was following a path that just wasn't him and he was done pretending and maybe in his intoxicated mind just decided that he was going to go for it. He was going to flee. He was going to live a life he wanted. But then when the alcohol wore off, maybe he liked where he was and didn't want to go back. I do think it's a huge possibility that he ended up with a homeless and that because he hated the fact that his family had money so much, he never wanted to borrow money, he never wanted to really have anything to do with them and their wealth. He wanted to do things in his own way. And maybe he had a little bit of imposter syndrome where he constantly felt like a fraud and feared being outed as somebody who didn't deserve the money he was born into or the money that he had been handed all those years prior. Or maybe he was gay and feared being outed in a religion that didn't accept that. And unfortunately, I think that that happens with a lot of people, especially years prior, but even still today. And that's truly just heartbreaking that people can, in both of these cases, people felt like they couldn't just be themselves and love who they want to love. and live a life that they deserved because other people had expectations for them. I also think in Sam's case, there could have been some underlying mental illness that could have been present in the alcohol, maybe brought it out more, and he just, maybe this landed him in danger in the end, maybe this had him end his life, but in both cases, they're so baffling, and I just wanted to bring them to you because I think that on New Year's and in the new year, we all get this sense of hope for the future. And I think there's so much expectation on it that it can be a lot of pressure. And I just want you guys to know that if you're feeling that just heightened amount of weight on your shoulders, just take a moment to breathe because yes, last year or this, you know, year right now could have been horrible. The next could be great. This could be great. The next could be horrible. But I do believe that the number one thing that matters is that you are living for you and you are doing things that make you happy. And that's all that should matter. And it's all that you should be fighting for. It doesn't have to be a perfect life. You don't have to completely change your life. You don't have to uproot, change your name, go somewhere else to still live a wonderful life and to get the life you want and the life you envision for yourself. 
you can do it right here right now but if that's not something you want if you feel this pressure to become a new person in the new year even though you like who you are and where you're at that doesn't need to happen you can say all I'm gonna work on is being a better person and helping others feel the way I feel that can be just as wonderful and it just I really hope that you all don't feel this sense of dread for the new year knowing that it has to be something huge or knowing that you have to do something incredible because just living is truly incredible especially when you're in pain especially when you are unhappy especially when life is just plain hard sometimes and you don't have to have a mental illness you don't have to go through something traumatic to just struggle a little bit that's okay to struggle it's okay to want to take a day to yourself it's okay to just want to live a simple life and to not be an extraordinary person but it's also okay to reach for the stars and wish for them and know you're gonna get there one day it's just okay to be who you want to be and I hope you all know that and believe that because I truly believe that for all of us every single one of you I think that sometimes we put this pressure on ourselves that we need to make a million dollars or cure cancer but the truth is if you hold the door for somebody if you give somebody a hug when they are feeling down if you let somebody know how much they mean to you that is changing the world every single day every single moment for the better and that's I think the the most important thing in this life is to make the world better just by small acts of kindness things that go unnoticed in the moment but won't in the long run and yeah I just I want y'all to know that 2020 can be the best year of your life and that doesn't have to have a set goal that doesn't have to look like everybody else's 2020 does it can just be you smiling holding an animal if you want holding yourself holding a loved one or holding a million dollars if that's what you want but I will say that this year I have been blessed with so many of you who make my life better every single day just by a comment a thumbs up a view a subscribe it, it truly doing those little things you have made the world a better place because you have made somebody happy and that happy person is me and I'm so grateful for all of you and going into 2020 I just want to continue having this beautiful community that supports each other so much is so kind to each other my comment section is incredible it's you guys are empathetic you are sincere you are helpful you are kind and most importantly you're loved by me every single moment of every day and I don't know why I'm getting emotional or why I'm continuing to talk but yeah just know I love you don't ever forget to speak up your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces okay bye